Uh, and it's a joy to, uh, to have this opportunity to share again with you from uh, this wonderful letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to Christians at Rome some 2,000 years ago. And isn't it a glorious thing that when um, the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to do that, that uh, God had not only the Christians that are at Rome in mind, but they had each of us, he had each of us in mind as well. An amazing thing that God, even if going back 2,000 years ago, he knew about this day. He foresaw this day. He knew each one of us would be here. He knew who wouldn't be here. And we knew, he knew that we'd be looking at the book of Romans. And he had a blessing prepared for us as we look into this book. <clears throat> and we trust that God uh, does have a blessing for us this morning, not to... Uh, not because of who the speaker is, but just because that when we look into his word and we focus on uh, what he tells us there about what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us, that we avail ourselves and experience the blessings that he indeed has stored up for us in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so last week we looked at the first 11 verses of um, Romans chapter 6. And we saw this transition as we went from uh, Paul explaining to his audience that the whole world comes under the, God's condemnation as sinners. And Paul spends some time from about Romans chapter 3 through Romans chapter 5 in explaining how we have the forgiveness of sins, justification, as a result of Christ's bloodshed on the cross. Last week, as we started reading in Romans chapter 6, we saw that Christ accomplished more at Calvary's cross than forgiving our sins. Having our sins forgiven is huge. It's big. And no one wants to take anything away from that. What a precious thing that is to be justified. To know, to have the confidence on the basis of what God's Word says that my sins are forgiven because of what Jesus Christ did for me. But as we get into this part of the book of Romans, we begin to see that Christ accomplished even more than that and what a marvelous thing that is. <clears throat> Last week we looked at how, in the first 11 verses, that Jesus Christ by his death on the cross sanctified us. This first aspect of our salvation is our justification, the forgiveness of sins. There's another aspect of our salvation that Christ procured or made happen at Calvary's cross. That is our sanctification. Something that he accomplished. It's a work that's finished. He set us apart from sin. And you remember that as we went through this, that we saw in, in Romans uh, 6 and verses 1 to 11, in particular in verse 2, it said that we died to sin. And that our old man is put away. Our old nature our sin nature, that which we inherited from Adam, uh, is crucified and buried. And we saw that in verses 4 and 6. And we saw last week also that we've been identified with the Lord Jesus Christ in his resurrection. I'm a new creation. The old is gone. Something very new has come. I'm born again. I've been raised up in newness of life with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we saw how the act of water baptism, although it doesn't do anything in and of itself, there's nothing supernatural or magic that happens when somebody's uh, baptized by immersion. But it's a symbol, a portrayal, and a proclamation of these great truths that we see explained in Romans chapter 6. That I've been crucified with Christ. And we sang some lovely hymns this morning that, that focus on these truths. That I've been crucified with Christ. And I've been buried. My old man has been put away, submerged. Uh, as it's symbolized in water baptism. And then when we come up out of the water, it symbolizes us being raised up together with him in newness of life. And uh, God wants any of us that have put our, our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to be water baptized. It's not that that uh, brings you into some special status as a Christian or that God's going to give you some extra blessing as a result of doing that. No, if you've believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, you've got all of God's blessings. But I believe he intends us to be baptized because that event is to be there in our minds and remind us of what Christ did for us at Calvary's cross. That the old was put away and that I'm a new person. I'm not uh, under the same 
uh, management that I was before, of this old man that used to direct what I did and what I said and what I thought and so on and so forth. As we looked at this <clears throat> last week, we considered our part, or if I can put it this way, our responsibility in view of these truths. Okay? The scriptures say that we died with Christ and that we've been raised up together. What is our responsibility? We looked at last week at that God wants us to know about these things. It's important. It's essential for us to know what Christ accomplished at Calvary's cross. And in verse 6 of Romans 6, it says, knowing this. Okay, everything that's going to proceed from this point is based on this revelation of truth. You need to know this. We looked at that last week. That was one of the key points. You need to know that our old man was crucified with Christ. Why? So that the body of sin might be done away with, so that we should no longer be slaves of sin. You need to know that. That's our responsibility as believers, to get into the Word of God and allow the Spirit of God to reveal truth to us. Because the normal Christian life is all about, and we looked at this last week, getting our focus fixed on the facts, turning our eyes upon Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And we also saw that knowing the truth, then, we need to act in view of it, or reckon it, to be true. And in verse 11 it says, Likewise you also reckon yourselves or count yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we saw how having had this truth revealed to us about what Christ did, how he sanctified us, how he set us apart at Calvary's cross, that we need to put our trust in that. We need to believe in it. And we looked at, at what real Christian faith is. <clears throat> that how Christian faith takes the Word of God and it turns it into a reality. It substantiates it. It gives it substance. Something that we have a conviction about. And it makes it real in our experience. Right? That when we act upon this truth and rely upon it and count upon it, that we actually find that in fact, we experience its truth. Right? So without faith, it's impossible to experience this truth of having been identified with Christ in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Today, we're going to look at another key word. We looked at two last week, knowing and reckoning or counting. And we're going to look at another key word, and it's revealed in the next three verses. We'll just look at three verses today, and we'll start at verse 12 and read through verse 14 in Romans chapter 6. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. <clears throat> Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Heavenly Father, we thank you for, for your word. It's our desire to pause, to pray now at this time that we might acknowledge your greatness, and our need of you, Father. That as we look into your word and we look at some of these things which uh, can be difficult to understand and perhaps even more difficult to see them applied in our lives, Father, we acknowledge our need of you and our need for your spirit to, to cause the things that you would desire to happen to happen, Father. That we might know these things. That we might see them as true. And that then we might present ourselves to you in view of them, Father. We just trust that your Spirit will be our teacher and guide, that perhaps we might see something uh, today that we haven't seen before, or perhaps something that we haven't been reminded of for some time, because we know, Father, how quickly we forget and go back into acting in the old ways. Father, we just pray that we might come away this morning with renewed minds, Father, that we might experience a greater measure of Christ in our lives. And this we, we pray in his name. Amen. <coughs> So what we're going to look at this morning is the third part, then, of our responsibility, if I can put it that way, uh, in view of what Christ has done in sanctifying us at Calvary's cross, that is, setting us apart from sin. And we're told in these three verses, in particular, we see it in verse 13, that we are to present ourselves to God as being alive from the dead. I'm reading to you from uh, the New King James Version. 
If you have an original King James, I believe the word yield is used. I got somebody with a King James that'll nod at me. Yeah, yeah. And I think if you have a um, New International Version, I think it uses the word offer. Is that correct? Offer yourselves. Okay. So you can see this principle of presenting and offering or yielding yourself to God as being alive from the dead. And I've also put this other word up here on the screen that many people would refer to this as consecration. To dedicate for a purpose or for use. There's a lot of misunderstanding about consecration. Um, And sometimes we can easily fall into the trap of consecrating to that, that to God, which really what he wants done with it is to have it crucified. We try to do things for him in the old ways and in the old strength, and it really doesn't amount to much. You know, it says in the scriptures that uh, without faith, it's impossible to please God. We need to first of all know what his word says. And this is important stuff that we've been looking at in Romans 6. We need to believe in it. And then... When we do that, when we fix our eyes upon what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us at Calvary's cross, then the Spirit of Christ empowers us to serve Him. And we want to not present to God or offer to God, not the old, but you'll notice what it says, to present yourselves to God, how? As being alive from the dead. Present your new person. Present your new life. Offer the new life that God has given to you to Him. Notice in this passage that the word sin is used. Of course, uh, we see this in uh, verse 12. It says, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body. And it says in verse 13, Do not present or offer or yield your members or parts of your body as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. There's a transition that's taken place from the first five chapters of Romans to this chapter. In the first five chapters, it tends to talk about sins. Those are the evil acts, the wrong stuff that I do, the stuff that I do that doesn't please God. But those sins proceed from sin, if I can put it that way. And again, or I'm a, or I sin rather because I'm a sinner, right? And sin is a principle that works in the members of Adam's race, right? That we have this fallen nature that we naturally inherit from our parents where we naturally tend to do things that are wrong. That's a principle, a law, in some parts of Romans, Paul calls that a law or a principle that works in the members of Adam's race. And so this sin, when we read that, we need to keep in mind that what Paul is referring to is the fallen Adamic nature of mankind to do evil. The scriptures then are saying, therefore, do not let that sin nature... Your old man, as it's referred to in uh, verse, is it six? Yeah. Verse six, do not let your old man, your old nature, reign in your body. It's a good question to ask. Who's in charge? Who is your ruler? Who is it that you are going to present yourself to as your ruler? Is it your old man or is it going to be God? This scripture says that we should not do something. Now, biblical Christianity isn't a set of rules. It's not a bunch of do's and don'ts. But we see here a couple of do's and don'ts. And it's not laying out a bunch of laws that we have to follow. But this is the principle, that if we are going to walk by faith, if we are going to be empowered by Christ's Spirit, that there there are some things that we do need to do and some things that we need to avoid. And these are spiritual principles that then put us in a position where we're going to be empowered by the Spirit of God. And as we read through these passages, we see, first of all, in verse 12, that we're told to not let sin reign in our mortal bodies. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. You see, we make a choice. We face a choice that when... Uh, a temptation or a uh, solicitation to sin comes, we have to make a choice. Am I going to yield to that? Am I going to present myself to that old way, that mode in which I operated before I came to know Jesus Christ as my Savior? And am I going to obey and submit myself to the desires of my old evil nature? 
the Scripture says, in view of what we've looked at, in view of the fact, and these are God's facts, that that old man was crucified and that you've been set apart from him and that you died to sin, do not present yourself to that nature anymore. Do not let sin, your sin nature, your old man, reign in your body. Do not obey his evil desires. <clears throat> we see in verse 13, it says, do not yield your members or the parts of your body to sin, right? Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. And that's what we need to see our, our body parts as. My mouth, even my mind, what I think is one of my body's members. My mouth, my, my mind, my eyes, my hands, my feet. All of those things are instruments that God has given me. The scripture says we're fearfully and wonderfully made. Right? And the question is, who am I going to present the instruments of my body to? Am I going to yield them to my old sin nature, to my old master? Am I going to allow them to be instruments of unrighteousness? Or am I going to go on to this do list that we see in verse 13. The scriptures say that in contrast that not presenting ourselves to our old master to sin, we are to present ourselves to our new Lord and master. Becoming a Christian means that I have a new master. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is my Lord. He is my master. And we're told to present ourselves to this new master. You know, some people, when they read these first 11 verses that we looked at last week in Romans, might come to the conclusion that what happened at, Cal at Calvary's cross resulted in my old sin nature being completely annihilated and it doesn't even exist anymore. And it's quite an, a disappointment, not very long after that, that you find, wait a minute, that old man still exists. Still exists. What's happened is you have been separated. There is a separation that's taken place. But you can still make this choice, if I want to, to go back to the old ways and serve in the old ways. The old man is still there. He's up on the cross. And the only thing he can yield is death. You have to decide, do I want to abide in death? I was dead in trespasses and sins. And that old man has been judged rightfully by God on Calvary's cross. Do I want to abide in that? It, what doesn't produce anything of value to God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ said this to his disciples, you can do nothing. Do I want to abide in nothing? Which is basically where my old man is on the cross. Do I want to go back to that? Or am I going to abide in the new life that God has given me? Am I going to present this new life to him voluntarily and say, God, this is yours. My hands are yours. My feet, my mouth, my eyes are yours. <clears throat> and I do this as being alive from the dead. It's not an attitude of what I do for God. But it's an attitude of what God can do through me. Because it's God that's given me this life that I have. I can do nothing in and of myself. And that old man that wants to do things in his own strength and in his own power to please God isn't in charge anymore. <clears throat> and so we are to present ourselves to God as being alive from the dead. And also in verse 13 it says to offer or present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. You see, God's will is that we would not be dominated by sin. We see this in verse 14. It says, For sin shall not have dominion over you. It shall not rule over you. That's a very uh, straightforward revelation of God's will. God doesn't want sin to rule over you. He's ordained that it would not rule over you. And He's made provisions so that it will not reign over you. But at no point is he going to take your free will away from you. Right? It's your choice. If you still want the old man to run the ship, he'll let you. He'll let you. But he's made provision for you to experience victory over that old way. And he calls us to present ourselves to him. <clears throat> 
so that we are no longer in this mode of sinning by nature. The Scriptures say in verse 14 that we're uh, no longer under law, but we're under grace. You see, in our former condition, in our old ways, we were under the condemnation of God's law. The wages of sin is death. But we've been translated out of that old kingdom where the old man ruled into a new place, into the kingdom of the Son of His love, it says elsewhere in the Scriptures. We've been translated out of darkness and into light. And we have a new life. <clears throat> and we are no longer under law and its condemnation. But verse 14 says that we are under His grace. In fact, what that means is that we have been positioned in a place of God's favor. Isn't that a marvelous thing? That I don't have to earn blessing from God. That I just avail myself of something that God has made provision for in the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't have to beg for blessing from Him. I don't have to wonder whether perhaps there's something more that, that God will give me if I'm, if I'm a good person or whatever it might be. That it's all there for me in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's just a question of me presenting myself to God in this new life that He's given me and availing myself or, or taking advantage, if I can use those words, of the blessings that God has laid up for me. So often, we miss those things. We don't enjoy those blessings because we fall back into the old ways. We think, well, I've got this pretty much under control and I can handle this. And we don't see how much we are in need of God. And we don't even realize that what we've done is we've handed the wheel over to the old man and we're missing out on some of the marvelous blessings that are ours in the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> There's a related um, verse in Romans chapter 12. You don't have to turn in your Bible. It's up on the screen. Perhaps if you're listening on the internet, you might turn in your Bible to Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. And Paul says there, I beseech you, or I urge you, brothers, fellow Christians, in view of God's mercies, that you do what? Here it is, a very similar sort of language. To present or offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Look at what he says there. Just step aside and just think about what Paul says. Present your bodies... A living sacrifice. Now, if you want to contrast old with new, think about in the Old Testament when um, uh, someone in the nation of Israel wanted to um, make an offering of worship and adoration to God. One of the things that, that was prescribed that they could do was to bring a burnt offering. It was a free will offering. But it involved bringing an animal, and what did they do to the animal? It was killed. It wasn't a living sacrifice. It was a dead sacrifice. But you see, that was the old way. And the old way always resulted in death. Didn't it? And you see, our old ways result in, 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 in dead works. Things that are of no value to God. But we are to present ourselves as living sacrifices. It says. Living sacrifices to God. And that's in quite a contrast to the Old Testament sacrifices that, that were always slain. And it says that that sacrifice that we consecrate or dedicate to God is holy and acceptable. Well, that means it can't be my old ways and it can't be my old man because my old ways are not holy and acceptable to God. They're only worthy of one thing, and that's death. And that's exactly what Christ accomplished at Calvary's cross. That's why he's called the last Adam in 1 Corinthians 15. Because they were crucified there. So what is it that I'm going to present to God? It's this new life that I have. I'm alive from the dead. And that is holy holy and acceptable only because Christ has sanctified us. He is the one that has made us holy and acceptable to God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Uh, In verse 30, it says, But of him, that is God, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God 
and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. He is our sanctification. That is, He is the one in Him we find holiness. In Him we are made acceptable to God. In Him we are set apart from the old and we have a new life. <clears throat> and then finally it says that this is a reasonable service. This is the reasonable thing for us to do. This is an intelligent thing for us to do. It is a spiritual thing for us to do. You remember in the Old Testament, again, if you go back to the Old, that God required certain outward things to be done. There were all of these different rituals that they had to go through. And they were imposed by law, weren't they, from the outside. And they were external rituals that had to be um, made or performed. But this service, this new and living way, this sacrifice or this consecration that we make to God is something that comes from inside. It's not something that is uh, imposed externally. But we, in having this new life, have the indwelling spirit of Christ. And this is something that we willingly do. That I'm going to come to God and I'm going to say, God, this new life that you've given me is something that I'm going to offer and present and yield to you this is reasonable for me to do. This is reasonable service. In Ephesians chapter 2 and 10, it says, for we are his workmanship. We are God's workmanship. It's God that has created us anew. We were created in Christ Jesus. Why? It says for good works. But that's the reason. That's what God has set us apart unto. He set us apart from sin so that we can perform good works of service for his glory. Many people fall into the trap of thinking that it's the good works that are going to save me. That if I do good things, that God will find me acceptable. Absolutely not. I find my acceptance in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's given me a new life. What am I supposed to do with that new life? I offer it to him so that his spirit can empower me to do the good works that God intended me to do from before the foundations of the earth. The verse says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's on the back of your, your outline at the bottom of, um, of uh, the outline on the back side. <coughs> okay. There's an application on the, on the back side. And uh, rather than just read it today, and I invite you that, that, that have the outline uh, to take the time to read it later on, but I'm just going to try to capture it here. Because some of these things, we struggle a little bit with how, how we're going to apply them to our lives. And what we do, and Brother Al mentioned this uh, in the opening when we were singing, what we do has everything to do with where we're looking. You know, whether we're driving a car or an airplane or or whether I'm going skiing and I'm going to pilot myself down the hill or whatever it might be, that where I go, my body's going to fall where my eyes are. Right? And so we have to have an accurate view, a scriptural view, of the position that God has put us in. We've got to see where we are, and we've got to know where God wants us to go in order for us to act in a, in a, in a manner that's acceptable to Him. And what we see is that the cross really constitutes a huge divide for Adam's race. That the cross of Christ represents a divide for all of humankind. And we see on the screen here, on the left-hand side, that the old position, this is the position that I was in before I put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And anyone that's here that doesn't believe that they need to have their sins forgiven, or anyone that's listening on the internet that doesn't believe that they need their sins forgiven and hasn't put their trust in Christ is in this position. They're on this side of the cross, on the old side. They are under sin's rule. And sin is a cruel master. Okay. Sin is a cruel master. There's those that revel in sin and enjoy it because it does have a pleasure for a season. But oh, in the end, it has a sting that leads to death. And others struggle to be free from it and in their own strength try to stop sinning. I'm going to make this New Year's resolution. 
I'm going to stop gossiping. I'm going to whatever it is. I'm going to stop doing it. But then what happens? They fail. Because sin is a cruel master that will not let go of its captives. Only God can break those chains. In our former position, we're habitual sinners. And we naturally yield to sin's evil's desires. And we present our bodies to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. We're separated in that old position from God. Separated from God. We're dead in trespasses and sins and under the condemnation of law. But the marvelous thing is, is that the cross presents us with a way to have a new position. But we must pass through the cross in order for us to be translated into this new position. And this is Christ's work of sanctification. We've been reading this in Romans uh, chapter 6, that we were crucified with Christ and the old nature is done away with and buried. We're separated from the old, this old position that we had through death and raised up in newness of life. And now we're separated from that old way unto God. I was once separated from God and I had this relationship with sin that was inseparable. It was all, you know, part of me. But now I've enjoyed this separation from that and I'm separated from sin unto God. I'm no longer under law's condemnation and I'm now positioned in the position of God's favor. And we see this in verse 14. And so through the cross, I'm translated from this old position, this old kingdom of darkness, into this new position, this new kingdom of the Son of God's love into this new kingdom of light. And in that new position, I have a union with Christ. I'm made one with Him. That's what's made it possible. That I have been made one with Him in death and burial and resurrection. And not only that, but the Scriptures say that I've been raised up together with Him and I'm seated with Him in the heavenly places. That I have rest from wrestling against this old man because he's won the victory from me. I'm now seated with Him at the right hand of God. And I'm no longer under the rule of that old sin nature and under that old man. I'm now under the rule of God's Spirit. I'm under the rule of God's Spirit. But there's a marvelous thing if you think about it. And you will have, known, you will have experienced this as a Christian. That this new master that you have, God, and the Holy Spirit that lives in you, is not one that takes you captive. If you want to go back and serve the old master, that can happen, right? You can fall into sin and you can go back to the old ways. Your former master would not let go of you. The sin nature holds you captive and there's only one person that could break the chains and that's Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can set people free from that old master. They cannot have that freedom from the old master of their own strength and power. It's only Jesus Christ that breaks those chains. But now that you've been brought into this new position, this new master is different. He's not a tyrant. And he doesn't hold you captive. He invites you to present yourself to him and to avail yourself of this victory that he purchased with his own son's blood. He doesn't force you. You're not a puppet. And you know that if if you've been a believer for any time. If you want, you can go back and serve the old master. And sometimes it just happens sort of gradually, doesn't it? You don't even realize it. But God invites us to voluntarily present ourselves to Him. Right? Understanding and believing the truths that are in Romans 6 doesn't exempt you from sinful temptation. Right? Just because we've looked at Romans 6 and we know what it is that Christ did at the cross and we believe it doesn't mean now that you're going to be exempted from sinful temptation. Believe it. This that the old master once in a while is going to knock on your door and he's going to say, are you going to come out to play? Are you going to serve me? And this is where you're going to have to make a choice. Who is my master? Who is it that I'm going to present my body to to serve? Am I going to go back to serving the way that I did in the old ways? Or am I going to present myself to my new master, the Lord Jesus Christ? I trust that some of these things, that um, that as we look at them, that uh, they'll be an encouragement to you. I know myself, even this week, as I was looking through this and preparing for today, I was reminded 
of how often I need to look at these things and how often I need to be reminded of the victory that I have in Christ. And there was a few times even this week as when temptation came to my door, so to speak, and I stopped for a minute and I thought, you know, I'm just a split second away from yielding to that temptation and going back to serving this old man who's of no value. He's been put away. If I go back into that mode, I'm just abiding in, in, in a death that just produces nothing of value to God whatsoever. Why, why do I want to do that? And consciously making this decision that, no, I'm going to present myself. And it usually starts with the mind. I want to present my mind because when the solicitation to do evil comes, it generally is an appeal that starts in the mind where we have to make a decision whether I'm going to do this or that. I'm going to say this or that. And I found myself this week even that as I was looking through this, that it even affected the way that I would pray in the morning. That you get up in the morning and you realize that in any given day, there's a huge potential to serve either one master or the other. You're going to serve somebody. You, know, you were designed to. And as each day comes along, you will either serve your old way and your old master and serve in the natural way, or you will serve God. And the question is, which is it that I'm going to do? And I found myself this week as I was preparing for this that it really it had an impact even on the way that I prayed in the morning. That it was something that uh, I desired as I got up each morning to be presented to God for righteousness' sake. That I realized that there's a tremendous potential for me falling back into the old ways and I go to work and the things that I do, I'll just be like everybody else. You know, I'll be selfish. I might say unkind things. I may make crude comments. And, oh, I've done all of those things. But there was this desire to see this life that God has given me as consecrated to Him, to offer to Him, and realizing that if I try to do things in my own strength, just nothing amounts of it. It's just the old ways, and those old ways should be long gone. So I trust that as we look through some of these things that, the, that it, it's a blessing to us, that we're reminded of really what it is that we have in Christ, and we see that we do have a responsibility. We need to know what happened. We need to believe that what happened at Calvary's cross is true. That indeed I have been crucified and raised up with him. And then I need to present or offer myself to God in view of those things. And that we make decisions moment by moment, day by day. Who am I going to present myself to? Who is your master? What does the word of God say?